Or, oh, man. I have to admit, this is probably one of my least favorite Scripture passages to preach on. Because it's hard for us to understand. Right? Because Jesus... This is the first thing that Jesus ever does in His ministry in the Gospel of Matthew, right? In chapter 4, He was baptized, sent into the wilderness for 40 days. And now that He's done, He came and He called His disciples. And as they're gathering along the shoreline, He sees all these people. He goes up the mountain. The disciples come up to Him. He sits down and He starts to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are... Those who mourn. Sorry, I forgot it for a moment there. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Right? Blessed are you. Honorable. Blessed. Honorable. Favored. Happy. It doesn't mean happy. Blessed doesn't mean happy. You have to think in an honor and shame society, right? Because that's what it was. It was you either... So what you did either brought honor to yourself or it brought shame to yourself. So... Honored are you if you are poor in spirit. Or honored are you if you mourn. Honored are you if you are meek. Honored are you if you are hungry and thirsty. Do those sound like things that bring us honor? Or bring us favor? Not really. That's not really what I think of when I think of honor and favor. But let's take a step back here for a moment. We had 12 verses this morning from the Gospel of Matthew. Two verses as an introduction. And then 3 through 12 were the blessings, right? And how many blessings were there? Did anybody count them as we went along? I'd be very impressed if anybody knew that number off the top of their head. Ooh, who said that? Nine. There's nine of them. There's two groups of four, and then there's a single one, right? It's actually poetry. It's broken up into three sections. The first two are groups of four. The first group of four is the promise of eschatological reversal to the unfortunate. The second group of four is the promise of eschatological rewards to the virtuous. Let me say that in plain English now. The first four are the end of time reversal of fate to those who have been held down. And the second four are the end of times re- um, reward for those who help undo the holding back of those who were held on the first four. And then the f- ninth one is just completely different and stands all on its own. Right? Because it's blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are you. Right? The last one is a you. We're no longer talking about that other person out there. We're now talking about ourselves. But let's get back to that poetry, right? The first eight are written in groups of four. Each group of four has 36 words. Maybe not in English, but in the original language. Each group of four has 36 words. And the first four... How I know that this is poetry. The first four actually start with the same letter. Again, it's not in the English, right? Because we have blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, and blessed are the hungry. In the Greek, all of those start with the same letter. It's poetry. Jesus is telling his disciples a poem about what the world is about. Right, And he starts out with, blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Not like Luke, where blessed are the poor who don't have any money. right? Because we could all relate to that. Um, but Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And what does that mean? Not strong in faith. Not, strong in faith. Not quite. Close. It's a little bit darker than that. <laughs> this is a really interesting one for Jesus to start with. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Basically what Jesus, Jesus is saying here is, blessed are those who have no hope. 
You have no hope. The Greek word here implies that it's more than just being without the necessities of life, but living in a state of destitution. Being destitute in spirit implies that one is incapable of getting out of poverty. This is absolutely a characteristic none of us would seek. Because if you've ever been hopeless, you don't ever want to go back. So blessed are you if you have no hope. And blessed are you if you mourn. And what do you think of when Jesus says, blessed are you when you mourn? What are you thinking of? Death. Again, it's a little bit darker than that. Basically, Jesus is saying here, blessed are you if you have, cannot find any reason for joy. It's not that you're mourning the loss of someone. It's the fact that nothing in your life can bring you joy. Blessed are you if you find no hope. Blessed are you if you have no joy. Blessed are you if you are meek, which means what? Quiet, not quiet. I'm, I'm, I'm old and half deaf. You people need to speak up. <laughs> Timid? No. Don't, that's a little bit closer, yeah. Hum, humble, not, not as quiet, don't matter. How many of you have a, a piece of, of something outside your door that you wipe your feet on? It's a doormat, right? Blessed are you if you're a doormat. And then blessed are you if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. This hunger and thirst, the interesting part to this one is here is the hunger and thirst are present participles. What does that mean? English teachers? Participles. I see, I see a light bulb going on over here in a pew. Present participle means that it's an action that has consequences now, but continues on into the future. It's a continual Hungering, a continual thirsting. It's not a one time thing. It's an all the time kind of thing. You hunger and thirst for righteousness or for dikaios. It means righteousness or justice. Hunger and thirst for what is right or what is just. Right? These first four, I'm going to quote a book here by Mark Allen Powell. Theologically, then, the point of these first four Beatitudes is not to offer entrance requirements for the kingdom of heaven, but to describe the nature of God's rule which characterizes the kingdom of heaven. The people who benefit when God rules, Jesus declares, are those who otherwise have no reason for hope or cause for joy, who have been denied their share of God's blessing in this world and deprived of justice. In short, people for whom things have not been the way they ought to be. For such people, the coming of God's kingdom is a blessing because when God rules, all All this will change and things will be set right. And in other words, these are people who have been put in a place that they have nothing to do with and they can't possibly get themselves out of. These are not things that we seek to be in order to get God's praises. We're not supposed to seek to be poor in spirit. We're not supposed to seek to be meek. We're not supposed to seek to mourn. We're not supposed to seek to be hungry and thirsting for righteousness. Now that may sound a little weird. Because we should be. But not in the way that Jesus is talking about here. Because these people cannot get themselves out of these places that they are. So then the next four. Blessed are the merciful. Which means... Those who, when you have mercy on somebody, what does that normally bring? Forgiveness Forgiveness or healing. Those who forgive. Those who heal. Blessed are the pure in heart. Does that mean like we don't ever think about anything that we shouldn't? I won't ask you to raise your hands of those who don't think about things that they shouldn't. Because I would remind you that we're in church. 
And we've already confessed. I don't want to have to do this confession again. So, um, no, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not about keeping our mind pure. It's about keeping our mind purely on God. It's about being single-mindedly devoted to God. Everything that we do has to follow behind what God is calling us to do. To be pure in heart is one who puts his whole life, his or her whole life, behind God and follows every step of the way that God is leading them. Blessed are the peacemakers. The peacemakers are those who actively seek reconciliation for others. Not for themselves, but for someone else. And then the fourth one. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness or justice. Seems a little... Jesus is saying, blessed are you if you're persecuted because you seek after justice. Is it about the persecution? That's where we get hung up. I don't think the emphasis here is on persecution. The emphasis here is on commitment. It's like for those of you who are at Bible study this past Wednesday, we talked about the parable of the sower, right? Jesus went out and cast seed and some of it fell on different places. But this is about the the part in there in the parable of the sower where the seed fell on the ground and it took root and it sprung up with joy because the hearer heard the word and they were drawn in and then persecutions came and they were choked off and they ran away. That's not these people who are persecuted for the sake of justice or righteousness. These are people who are committed for the long haul. And ready to take whatever comes at them. Because they know what God is leading them to do is the right thing for them to do. The glue that holds these eight together is, as I've been saying all along, the first four lack justice. And the second four are those who seek to bring justice to those who are a part of the first four. Right? And blessed are you, Jesus says there at the end. When people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you and falsely against you falsely on my account. Right. Blessed are you. It's no longer about someone else. It's now personal and it's about us. So what do we need to do about all of this? We need to listen to what the prophet Micah said. Right. How many of you know that verse? Right. When you say Micah. What was Micah famous for? Yep. Right? That's the only thing we know out of Micah. Micah's like nine chapters long. And when someone says the prophet Micah, most people go to Micah chapter 6, verse 8, which is, What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And in that verses there, those eight verses, the prophet breaks down for the people. God actually comes to the people and he says, what have I done for you that you're, that you're coming against me, right? The people are welling up against God. And God comes to them through Micah and says, what have I done to you? Oh yeah, let's think about this for a minute. This is what I've done for you. I brought you out of slavery from Egypt. I gave you Moses and Arian and Miriam. I gave you prophets to tell you what you need to do. When the kings had you under siege, oh, I'm the one that got you out of that trouble. So now what are you coming against me for? And the people say, well, then what can we possibly do? Can we offer you? And it's an it's it's an insane amount. If you go back and read it, can we offer you 10,000 rams or thousands and thousands of rivers and oil? What kind of a sacrifice is going to be good enough? And God comes back and says, this is what I want. I want you to do justice. To love kindness. And to walk. The word is humbly in the English. But it's not really humbly in the Hebrew. It's more deliberately or intentionally with your God. I want you to do justice. I want you to give to others what they've been denied because it is their inalienable right as a child of God 
And I want you to love kindness because that's what I did for you. When you were buried deep in your sin, I picked you up and cleaned you off and I loved you the way that you were. And I want you to walk deliberately with me. Because only through God are we going to see the things that need to be done. And only through God are we going to be able to do the things that Jesus has called us to in these Beatitudes. To look out for the other. To see them as they are. As our brother and sister. And not hold them down because they're different. But lift them up because that's what God told us to do. That's what He's calling us to do. To do justice. To love kindness. And to walk deliberately with our God. So let us go and make sure that everyone gets what they deserve as children of God.